Again, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for being with us today. My name is John Hanna. I am Director of Education at American Philanthropics Center for Civil Society. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by the Center for Civil Society and also Philanthropy Daily. Philanthropy Daily is our news and opinion uh, online journal. It's for all things on all things charitable. So if you don't subscribe to, to Philanthropy Daily, please do so. Uh, you'll get a follow-up email after today's webinar to, to join our email list. Uh, this topic today, it's very timely, of course. We are talking about fundraising when times are bad. This is part of a series. Uh, I would also encourage everyone to download our free ebook on the subject written by our own very own Jeremy Beer. Uh, the title of the book, also like today's webinar, is called Fundraising When Times Are Bad. You can download that book for free if you go to AmericanPhilanthropic.com. Uh, if you click on uh, About Us and then free ebook or an ebook, you, it'll take you to a page. You can download the ebook. It'll get to your e-box within an instant. Definitely encourage you to check out that book. And our guest today for this topic on fundraising when times are bad, uh, we have Joe Gerecht and Erica Quayle. First, let me introduce my colleague, Joe. Joe Gerecht is a managing consultant at American Philanthropic and has over 20 years of experience in fundraising and nonprofit management. Joe specializes in helping nonprofit organizations build dynamic fundraising strategies and systemize their development programs. And Joe is based in Philadelphia. Thank you, Joe, for being with us today. And also on the call with us is Erica Quayle. Erica is a Senior Director of Development at Hope International. Erica has led the Hope Development team now for four years, right, Erica? And you are based in Durham, North Carolina. Again, thank you both for being with us, and thanks to all of you for joining us for this conversation. Let's just get into the conversation, if you guys don't mind, uh, talking about fundraising when times are bad. The narrative that we hear right now is that, you know, we are in a recession or we're about to enter a recession. I'd let the, let the economists tackle that question at some other time. But the narrative is that things are not good, right? Um, and, but I also look at this and I say, well, you know, unemployment is quite low. You know, people are working. Americans are spending a lot of money on consumer goods, uh, on holiday gifts. I think we just had record um, spending on, on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. So people have some money, they're spending money. But the question that we have and why people are probably listening to us right now is, what does this mean for philanthropy, you know, the end of this year and certainly for 2023? So I'd, I'll ask you, Joe, and, and then Erica, what, what, would you, what advice would you give to a fundraiser if you could say, okay, what's one general rule that you would have for the coming year or like one thing to think about when you're thinking about the economy and the narrative that we hear every day in the news. Joe, let's go to you first. What do you think? Sure. Yeah, I mean, so it's hard to, obviously hard to predict. I can tell you that from working and living through and being a, a development director through the 2008 uh, slowdown, what we saw then was people did slow down on spending, ultimately. And they slowed down on spending, including charitable giving, and where we saw that was primarily in the low dollar and mid-level range, as opposed to the major donor level. So it was more pronounced among people who needed to worry more about their budget, right? That being said, what we have to remember is that Americans are among the most generous people on earth, right? Americans give more to nonprofits than any other uh, group of people, and they're going to continue to support nonprofits. So my, my biggest advice is don't cut down on activity, right? The fundamentals still matter. And that means as a nonprofit, you need to keep telling your story. You need to keep communicating. You need to keep cultivating and meeting and asking. When times are tough, for-profit businesses the one thing they don't cut down on is sales activity, right? They may cut down on other things. They don't cut down on sales activity. Frankly, they usually increase it. So my biggest advice to fundraisers is if the economy is bad, if the economy is good, no matter what the economy is doing, don't cut down on fundraising activity. Keep up your fundraising cadence. Keep up your fundraising activity. Great advice. Erica, any thoughts? 
about yeah. about end of this year and for next year. Yeah, you know, and I bring up this conversation, I feel like the answer is that it's always next year is always going to be a tough year, right? I think we've experienced that the last couple of years. We've had this expectation that, okay, this coming year is going to be tough on fundraising. So we really need to prepare for that. And so it feels like, okay, surely this year it's going to be more tough than it has been in the past. Surely this year the economy feels like it's in a, in a tough spot, but it's always uncertain how bad the economy is going to be next year. And it's always uncertain how fine it will be. And so I think we can only do so much, right, from where we sit now. But um, what I do know, and from our experience, is that our donors tend to surprise us with their commitment and their resilience, and that those who give from a place of being grounded in a commitment that's greater than themselves, they don't ebb and flow with the economy. So their giving might go up or down a bit, but their commitment to the organization doesn't just drop off. So I think, you know, the general rule that I think about with that is that, and this is the way that I coach our team, team of 40 people on the development team, stepping into leading our advancement team of 60, like the general role that we talk about is just that um, the measure of success is faithfulness. And it's not, you know, raising a certain amount of money, but it's being faithful uh, with the work that's in front of us. And so I think in 2023, like my, my thought would just be to be faithful in the way we engage our donors and continue to meaningfully engage them and meaningfully invite them into life-giving partnership with your organization, regardless of what the economy is doing. That's not being ignorant to the realities of the economy or naive to the impact it's having on them, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, but it's it's being faithful in continuing to engage them just as you would um, in, in inviting them into the work that your organization is doing. Great. That's wonderful advice. I should mention to our guests that are listening, if you have questions, you can drop those in the question and answer box or the chat, either one, and I'll get to those um, later on uh, during the webinar. Again, great advice from both of you. So my next question is that, of course, 2022 isn't over yet, right? I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Um, and, you know, a lot of fundraisers are going to raise sometimes a third of their giving, maybe more between Giving Tuesday and New Year's Day. Uh, you know, we have people that are doing a lot of year-end visits right now, or, you know, final phone calls or Zoom calls with their donors over this next couple of weeks. Given the inflation that we've seen this year, what would you say to a fundraiser um, to prepare them for a delicate conversation with the donor? So, you know, of course, like you just said, Erica, you know, some donors are feeling the pinch. Um, as far as their own personal finances or maybe their business. But we all know that nonprofits, they're they're feeling the pinch more than anybody else, right? Because they're trying to, um, you know, use, use their funding to do things that are possibly, you know, affected by in inflation more than anything else. So what advice would you give to fundraisers that really need to have a delicate conversation with a donor and kind of what you said, Erica, to, to you know, not, you know, to be, to, not to be, insensitive to not just brush over the fact that times are kind of hard for people. So Joe, we can go to you, to you first. What would you say to someone that's maybe dreading that hard conversation with the donor right now? Yeah. So I would say the biggest thing is to listen to your donor, right? Um, and that's easier said than done because as fundraisers, often we go into an ask or a solicitation uh, opportunity with a goal in mind. And we try and get to that goal. And so sometimes it's hard to listen to donors, but the most important, and this is important always in fundraising, right? But particularly now to ask questions, to ask your donors how they're doing to tend to listen to that. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't suggest basing your ask around, you know, the idea that the focusing on the, the the downturn, the inflation, the recession, and and leading with that, or, or you know, talking directly about that. I I much prefer listening and being empathetic and being able to adjust my you know my conversation, my ask based on what our donors are saying. Now, of course, if your nonprofit is dealing directly with the impact of an economic downturn, you know, for example, if you're a food pantry or you're a homeless shelter and you're, you're, the need is greater, then of course you're going to address that directly. 
Um, but in my mind, the most important thing is to listen, to ask donors honestly how they're doing, and to be willing to reconfigure your expectations and your conversations based on what they have to say. Great advice. Erica, thoughts on how to have a delicate conversation uh, with, with the donor right now? Yeah, that was definitely my first first comment. It's just that listening posture, right? And and asking intentional questions. So if you def, if you're going into the conversation, especially if you have an intention to invite them to give, I think it's just going in with a few things in mind. So one would be like doing your research, you know, reminding yourself everything you can about this supporter so that you go in with as much awareness as you possibly can have about their current situation, whether it's based on past conversation or things you can read in the news, right? So I think it's that's kind of our job to be as informed as we possibly can be going into it, but then to also prepare intentional questions that will allow the, the supporter to share with us where they find themselves, how things are going, how's your how are things going with your business? What does this year look like for you? What's been challenging this year? You know, just kind of thinking ahead of time about a list of a few questions that could help you understand really to care well for them more than to, you know, know their capacity to give, of course. Um, and I think with that, leading with gratitude, right? So going into that setting, just being thoughtful to say a specific thank you for the way that they've helped um, invest in where the organization is and is able to be at this point in the year. And I think, um, like Joe said, really sharing honestly, um, about where you find your organization. I think our donors value our transparency. And so if, yeah, like Joe said, exactly, that if you've been pinched by inflation, then name that and invite them to help. If they've, you know, find themselves in a place where they're not, they haven't been as effective, invite them to help, not out of desperation, but out of a place of standing shoulder to shoulder in partnership and saying, here's the need, here's what we're encountering. And we know you would want to know about that. So um, I think that's it. And then one role that, you know, rule of thumb, we always share with our fundraisers, I think to the point of listening is talking less than 50% of the time. So just yeah. when you walk away from that meeting, confidently saying you talked less than 50% of the time, which will ensure that you've done a great job of that listening. So it's just a good, I always look, appreciate keeping that in mind myself in a, in a meeting. Yeah. Good advice, no matter what the economic climate is, I think for a fundraiser, if you're talking more than half the time, probably not good, unless the donor really just wants a lot of information, right? Um, Joe, you recently published a great article in Philanthropy Daily um, about how nonprofits might consider moving forward with in-person events in this economy. This is a question that we've been getting quite a bit here at American Philanthropic lately, You know, in-person events right now. Can you just share your, your general thoughts from the article and what people might want to think about when it comes to events uh, in 2023? Sure. Well, I think, I mean, certainly the past two years, right? And then also this year, past two years with the question of would people want to go to in-person events? And then this year, as the economy changes, uh, uh, the question about um, highest and best use of resources of the organization it's it, this has really been a great time to look at the ROI for fundraising events, the return on investment that your organization is getting for fundraising events. Now, I'm a fan of fundraising events, you know, so I'm not one of those people who's saying stop holding all events. Um, but it's a good time to ask the question for each of your events: Is this an event we should be having? Um, is this an event that? If we if we invested the same amount of time, the same amount of money into another fundraising strategy, would we raise more money? Would we would we would we develop better relationships with our donors? Because you know, events can be a good way to develop a base level relationship with donors, but nothing beats you know putting more time into one on one cultivation. So. That's my biggest, you know, my biggest suggestion. Now, in terms of actual events, if you say, yes, we've taken a look at it, we believe the ROI is there, we believe that we have the people who want to come to the in-person events, then it's really focusing on what are those parts of your events where you can really grow that return on the investment, right? So things like focusing on sponsorships and leadership gifts, for the events, um, focusing on building deeper relationships with your event sponsors. So if you're if you're running an event where 
you have annual event sponsors, but you're not cultivating them for other gifts throughout the year, this may be a good time to do that. So you can leverage that relationship that you already have. And then also, same, same kind of thing. How do you leverage the relationship with event attendees into additional longer term gifts, right? So there's a lot of organizations that run galas, they get a lot of event plus ones that come through, they get a lot of event uh, sponsor uh, or sponsor table attendees, and they think, okay, well, we're our relationship is with the sponsor. There's a lot of opportunity to add those people into your cultivation system. So event there's always going to be a place for nonprofit fundraising events. The biggest thing to do when, particularly when the economy, you know, when there's questions about the economy is how can we take all the work that we're putting into this one event and leverage it into more relationships and ultimately more revenue? Very good. Very good advice. Uh, Erica, you, of course, lead a fundraising team at Hope International. And you know, we're talking a lot about meeting these fundraising goals, just like any other year and meeting the goals in this economic climate. But I also worry about early career fundraisers right now. You know, I worry about them getting discouraged in times like this, especially again, if they're new. What advice do you have for new fundraisers right now, but also advice for development managers like yourself who are trying their best to mentor uh, their employees right now, when again, it might not be as easy to raise money as it in, as it might be in what we call normal times or times of economic growth. But what would you say? Yeah, such a thoughtful question because <laughs> it is hard to get started in this economy. And I even, I mean, I think for sure for our team that started during COVID, we had a handful of new reps starting during like people, you know, complete shutdowns and we're hiring relational people. And so the, you know, the fact that they can't be meeting face to face and having those interactions that are the reason that they signed up for the job. Um, we saw such resilience from our team in that, but then now we are in a new, new phase of, of things and a new reality. And yet the economy is still, um, is in a bit of a different place. It was actually probably better in most cases, um, for a lot of people during COVID. So, um, I think there's, uh, yeah, there's a reality of one thing that we always hold true for our reps in their first year, which is that, um, we're not really measuring them on the funds that they raise. So we're looking at their retention, um, focusing on their retention of existing supporters and, and really their ability to meet goals there. But when we look at growing the fundraising, we're really not looking at that until their second year on the job, because in that first year, we really just want them investing in relationships. So I think that kind of helps in any setting, regardless of the economy, um, that approach kind of helps calibrate expectation in that first year. Um, but I think one thing I saw, and I saw this in a recent example, actually, um, from one of our reps who just started in August, um, but the, the opportunity to be grateful and gracious, even in the no. So as newer reps are hearing, no, no, I'm not interested in meeting. No, I'm not interested in giving. No, I don't want to come to the event or no, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, connect further with you. Um, how can they be gracious and grateful even in the no? So simply even in the response to that email, the fact that the donor's responding at all is a good sign. Yeah. So um, how can they even be, um, yeah, just gracious in the way that they respond, filled with gratitude? And um, what in this example that I just saw, this rep responded really graciously to this no, and the donor actually wrote back and said, please forgive me. I have been, I've changed my mind and I <laughs> want to get together and would love to connect soon. And she was just like, wow, like it's true. Just being faithful in the little things and the way that we respond um, makes such a difference. And I know that was a huge boost for her. So that won't always happen, but it's an example of just that graciousness, even in, in saying no, that I think goes such a long way. And whether the donor responds or not, they'll think of your organization as, as an organization that regardless of their giving or regardless in, of their interest in engaging, they were treated with care and appreciation. And I think that that's what we all want to you know, be about in the way that we engage with people. So I think about that. And then I think about also just really encouraging newer reps to focus on what's within their control. So similarly, we can't control a donor's response. We can't control what they give. We can't control if they say yes to meeting with us, but we can control our activity. So the requesting of meetings, reaching out via phone, just calling them on the phone and leaving a voicemail to say thank you, um, sending handwritten notes, activities of expressing personalized 
gratitude and invitation, I think, um, are what are within the control of a newer rep who maybe hasn't yet had the chance to engage directly, but can still show that really intentional um, communication and gratitude. So as an, as a manager coaching those reps, I'd really encourage them to focus on those activities in particular to help build a, a strong base for themselves. That is really great advice. And I love the story about, you know, the, the, the faithful, you know, fundraiser, you know, getting told no and just being pleasant and, you know, still having a good attitude. Like, like a lot of fundraisers, I myself started working in the phone or the phone bank as a college student. And anyone who's done that job knows that when you're, you're typically calling non-donors or very lapsed donors, and when you're calling them out of the blue, you never know what mood they're going to be in, right? A lot of times you call someone like, you know, they're having a bad day or, you know, whatever it might be, and they're just not in the mood to talk. And sometimes they're not pleasant. Um, but I love the story about how the, the donor writes you back or writes your fundraiser back and says, you know, I changed my mind. And just having just having the the intelligence in that in that moment to just again be grateful and be pleasant instead of just saying okay thanks goodbye i think that's a great lesson for people because again you never know what someone's going through um when you talk to them they, they might be a great donor prospect but if you don't catch them at the right time um of course you know you might not know that's that's a wonderful story uh, my next question for both of you is how valuable are in-person visits compared to let's just say 10 years ago so you know, right now travel is expensive, you know, not just for people going on vacation, but for fundraisers trying to travel. Um, so it's expensive. And, you know, online, online meeting technology, you know, Zoom, or MS Teams, whatever it might be, it's just a lot better than I think a lot of us imagined a decade ago. So the, the question is, do you suggest that fundraisers incorporate more online visits or do they give the donor the option? Uh, Joe, we can go to you first. What do you think? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously COVID changed fundraising forever, right? Yeah. I mean, there are tons of donors who, if you had asked them, if you had made a five or six figure ask over video call four years ago, would have thought it was the rudest thing they had ever seen. Right. And now they're perfectly comfortable with it and sometimes prefer it. Right. Yeah. So, we're never going back to, to the world before video conference, fundraising, cultivation, and solicitation. Um, in my, I mean, in my experience, there's also always going to be a place, right, for in-person donor cultivation. In my experience, in-person meetings, sharing a meal with donors who prefer that. And, and you know, John, as you said, you, you have to understand what your donor's preference is, and there, and you can figure that out just by asking them what their preference is. Um, but there's nothing that beats that. Yeah. So what I generally, you know, tell fundraisers is I still would opt for, um, you know, the in-person meeting for donors who are comfortable with it. And if your organization has the, um, the funds for that, you know, if, if, if you if your organization has the funds to send you to go meet with that donor if they're out of town, um, then I would still you know I would still opt for that. The other thing really that I've told organizations, particularly small organizations, you know there there was a time where lack of travel funding for gift officers was an excuse um, for why we weren't building you know donor networks in certain areas. So there'd be small organizations, you know, here in Philadelphia, and there would be donors who were, you know, interested in Pittsburgh or in San Diego, and they they wouldn't even be, you know, on the radar. That excuse is off, you know, it, it doesn't really apply anymore. I mean, obviously, there's always going to be a bandwidth, you know, a bandwidth um, calculation, and and obviously, we don't want nonprofits, you know, when we say that when we say what's your prospective donor base? It's not everybody everywhere because there's a bandwidth issue. But the idea that you have to be in front of a donor twice a year in order to be able to, to make significant asks is something that, you know, one of the few good effects of COVID of the past two years is that that's now available to nonprofits. Great. Erica, your thoughts on this, on online or Zoom visits versus in-person? Yeah. Yeah. 
full agreement. Nothing beats a face-to-face -face meeting, right? But that, yeah. as you know, I was just talking, I'm thinking, and some of that isn't just because it's better for the donor, but it's because it's better for the rep, right? Like yeah. the energy that we get from being in person with somebody, you think about the retention of our team and their enjoyment of their work and how life-giving it is for them. Like we all got so used to being behind a computer screen that it's taken so much momentum and so much intentionality to get back face-to-face -face with people. And I think we probably have to push our teams a little bit more than um, we might be used to, to kind of be back in that setting, even though that's really where they want to be, but it's just the momentum is working against that. And so I think even just, you know, whether it's for our own good or for the good of our donors, it's certainly better to be face to face, but it's also a gift that people are comfortable in the video setting and that they are willing to accommodate to that if needed. And it, I think one of the huge advantages of that is it means we can leverage senior leadership more in meetings, we can yeah. leverage program leadership more in meetings. Um, our president can connect with way more donors than he could otherwise, or even, you know, for us at Hope, our leaders around the world can join meetings that they otherwise, you know, it would not make any sense for them to travel to be a part of. So I think us, you know, being thoughtful and really trying for that face-to-face -face meeting if we can, but also um, being intentional in the way that we take advantage of that opportunity that we have. And we have seen I think um, for our team, we've seen that foundations are probably the, some of the most likely to be opting for that video setting versus having you come in person, right. um, maybe in particular because there's a group of them um, often, but that foundations are usually the ones that are saying like, telling you, this isn't an option, we're, we're doing video here versus yeah. um, giving you the option to kind of choose one or the other. Right, they know it's cost effective and it's easier for them to just meet um, over in that forum. And I liked your point about it makes it easier to include your organization leadership and your CEOs. And so there's no more excuses for people not having a half hour or an hour to engage a donor that maybe the development staff needs help with, right? Great. So we all know that economic downturns don't last forever, right? And so let's say that you have a donor that you know, they have very high affinity for your nonprofit. Let's just say that this hypothetical donor that they give every year for, you know, the last five, 10 years, but maybe they signal to a fundraiser that they just can't make a gift this year. Either the economy hit them hard for one reason, whatever it might be. What, what steps could a fundraiser take to let the donor know that they understand first, second, that they appreciate all the donors past support and what they've done and so overall, what can the fundraiser do to keep that relationship in a good spot so that they can re-engage the donor in a year or two and sort of maybe pick up where they left off? Joe, do you have any thoughts about that? If, don't, if a fundraiser is being told just not this year, what, what do you say? Sure. Well, I mean, obviously, fundraising is all about relationships, right? And this is no different. So your primary goal as a fundraiser in a situation like this is to maintain the relationship, right? And that requires, you know, empathy, obviously. And it also requires you, it also requires effort. It requires the donor to see that just because they're not giving this year, and it was probably very hard for them to say that, right? You have to realize that it's hard for a donor who supports an organization year after year to have to say, I can't do it this year. Right. Yeah. So we as fundraisers have to make it clear to those donors that just because they're not giving this year doesn't mean they're not still part of the team. They're not still part of our family as an organization. So, you know, in terms of actual conversation, you know, I, I like to um, acknowledge it. Right. You acknowledge you acknowledge the situation. You express empathy. And then you thank and recognize the donor for their past gifts. That's where you hear things like, we wouldn't be where we are today, you know, without the support you've given us all these years. Um, and then sometimes, depending on the donor, you can use unexpected ways to continue to steward them for that year. You know, I've seen situations where organizations have a longtime donor who's in a major donor club uh, or a giving society and can't do it for one year, and they just keep the donor in that giving club, right? Yeah. They continue because, you know, and, and that makes the donor feel great, right? Um, 
things like that that you can do to maintain that relationship because obviously you know the soft goal is to maintain the relationship the 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 other goal obviously is you want that donor to continue giving um, once they're able and so it's really a, a matter of stewarding them through that rough spot and letting them know they're really they are still an important and valuable part of the organization's community. That's really, really great advice. I like the idea about keeping the donor and the donor club possibly for some people that might be a good idea for some people, maybe not, but you know, I'm, I'm thinking, well, what's, what's really the harm in letting someone be in a donor club, you know, for a year, uh, Erica, any thoughts about this, what you would say to a fundraiser who's being told just not this year, what, what do you, what do you do? Yeah. I mean, I think, almost nothing changes from my perspective. Yeah. Right? Like you don't treat them any differently. There's nothing that you would do differently except maybe change your verbiage a bit to some of what Joe was saying. You saying thank you for the way your giving continues to help us have an impact or thank you for the way your giving has set us up to be where we are now, right? So it's instead of thank you for your gift this year of you know this amount, you're just kind of referencing the way it's set up the organization for where you are. So. I think some of that, again, if you're in a relationship and you know the why, it's just it's just kind of a natural moving forward with them. And we have a we do a donor survey every year. And one of the questions we ask is that my rep cares about me, regardless of my ability to give or the amount that I give. And I think that's really a measure of a successful relationship is that that donor feels cared for and appreciated regardless of their ability to give or not. And I think, again, our faithfulness to stick with them through that hardship, um, it's just so significant uh, caring about them well beyond um, their ability to transact with us by giving um, is a critical part of just building trust in their relationship. And I think our ability to do that when they're not giving is probably what builds more trust than anything else. So yeah. I love the idea if you do have that giving level, that type of club, um, so to speak, to keep them in it. We don't have that, but for us, that would look like you know, continuing to engage them as a major donor, as you would a major donor. And one other thing I think about is, you know, especially for people that are giving really significant amounts and then voice that, like, I think often major donors who are giving at very high levels will feel like if I can't give at that level, then I don't really, then I'm done, right? If I can't make my million dollar gift, yeah, then I can't give. And so even just finding the appropriate way to say, it doesn't have to be a million dollars. Like we value you as a partner with us for the long term, regardless of the amount you can give. So this year it's 10,000 or 1,000 or 100. You know, like we, we're grateful for your partnership and we value you just being a part of this work with us. Yeah. Finding the right way to say that based on the relationship, I think, is part of the message that I, don't, I find myself often coming to in those types of situations. Like I want them to know it doesn't have to be all or nothing <laughs> for us to feel like they're in this with us. That is such a good point. I have a few more questions for our guests. Um, hopefully some of our uh, the people in the audience can add some questions to the question and answer box um, while we answer these last few questions. So my next question is, you know, we're talking about fundraising when times are bad, the recession. Are there components of fundraising or elements of it that are recession proof? And things that I'm thinking of that might qualify would maybe be donor clubs, or maybe if you have a really good recurring gift operation in place and people are making those automated gifts via credit card or a donor advice fund, or or am I naive? Is, is, is anything recession-proof or not? Joe, what, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I mean, nothing's 100% recession-proof, um, yeah. but I think you're, you know, you're on the right track. I mean, the things that tend to be um, less, you know, less impacted, certainly major gifts, um, though not 100 percent, but but, you know, there's a, an element of recession uh, proofing in there. Um, donor clubs, because it's systemized and because it's a systemized stewardship process and a systemized giving process. Um, and yeah, I'd certainly, um, you know, uh, monthly gift programs, recurring gift programs. Uh, that's why one of the reasons fundry, you know, nonprofits love them so much right, is because you have to take an active step to stop giving them. And, you know, there's an certainly an element to, to uh, in those that, that helps in, in, in an economic downturn. Great. Erica, any thoughts about any facets or elements of fundraising that might be recession-proof or even somewhat recession-proof? 
I think what what you both have already gotten at is things that force a deliberate no. So if they yeah. have to intentionally say no to giving, then it's much harder to do versus just a passive, ah, I won't send my gift in this year. Yeah. So I think anything that systematizes that monthly giving or a donor club or something where there's kind of a expected rhythm of giving certainly helps. Um, I would think helps that a lot, but I think I, I just come back to, I mean, when I'm thinking of course about, um, you know, not our annual base here, but more of in our relational giving that that relationship really trumps everything. And it's so much harder to stop giving when you have a personal tie. So really just that, that personal engagement, I think about relationships with donors where they've, they've decreased their giving or stopped. And I can really look at, I've been way less communicative with them, or I've, I haven't spent as much time with them. And, you know, I can kind of see the trend of my own um, intentional engagement with them and the way it's been responded to in their giving. And so I think, yeah, kind of through recessions, like our ability to um, keep that relational tie with people will keep that keep us front of mind and make it a lot harder to make the choice to not give to our organizations since they care about a person that they are connected to at that place. And That's John, really, I, I, yeah. I would just add, just because we're in a recession or, or could be in a recession or inflation or any other economic issue, don't assume that's the reason why people are not giving or why they've stopped their monthly gift, right? We've all heard that, you know, the, the number one reason why people stop giving monthly gifts is because they, for you know, their, their credit card changes or yes, they yeah. stop giving because they forget. <laughs> Um, don't mm -hmm. assume now that it's, oh, it must be the economy, yeah. you know, still do the lapsed donor re-engagement that you would always do um, and let them tell you it's because of the economy. Don't assume. I totally agree. Never, never assume really anything when it comes to fundraising, I think is good advice. I have one more question, then we'll go to some audience questions. But the last question that I had was, you know, Giving Tuesday is behind us. I'm, I'm sure some fundraisers are saying, oh, thank God, right? But Giving Tuesday is behind us and we're moving on to December and Christmas and the holidays. In the spirit of end of year and Christmas, could you each share one memorable story end of year that's either a stewardship or a gift from a nonprofit that you worked for or that you, and Joe, in, in your case, it might be that you were consulting with. Just a really good feel-good story. Uh, Joe, what do you got? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, our conversation today about how to continue stewarding someone makes me think of a particular donor. I mean, that's um, from when I was a chief development officer at an organization. It was a donor who traditionally he and his wife gave a year end gift, a very large year end gift. Um, so we would we would do an ask during the year for their biggest gift of the year, but then they like to give it the year end as well. Um, and one year did not make that gift. And so in regular conversation, let me know that his business was not doing well. Um, felt so bad about not, and this comes back to when I said that donors, do, you know, they feel having to say that. Um, felt so bad that right before New Year, called back to tell me how bad he and his wife felt about not being able to make that gift. So that was a situation where we kept them at the same giving level. We stewarded them. That spring, um, I did my annual, essentially, ask meeting with them, but we didn't do it as an ask. So I think they were a little surprised that we still were coming out to visit them. And we did go out to, you know, I did go out to visit them um, and had a great meeting. You know, it was great. Fast forward, they didn't give the next year end either, but fast forward to the following year, the business climate had turned and he ended up selling his business and made a seven figure endowment gift wow. to the organization. Um, so that was between 18 and 24 months after that initial call uh, where he said, we can't make a gift. But just because we maintain the relationship, we continue to treat them with the same level of respect that we always had. When things did change, um, ultimately, it ended up in a really a transformational gift for that organization. So that's amazing. Sounds like a true legacy gift for the donor, too. And it's something that I'm sure that they're really proud about to this yep. day. That's amazing. Eric, could you have a story and a, a, 
good, memorable giving or stewardship story? Well, one of my favorite recent things is I'm um, just thinking about, we just did a, a match week and um, we, our total giving for the match week ended in 13 cents as we uh, included a 13 cent commitment from one of our staff's children. And I think like this is the time of year where there's such an opportunity for us to engage whole families in our work. And at Hope, we have a gift catalog as many organizations do. And I think there's so many beautiful examples um, of how families are engaging children in, in their giving and the gift catalogs are just a great catalyst for that. Um, also think about uh, the way that one memorable story for me is a way that a family engaged uh, the second generation in giving. And um, actually just before uh, I had my first child, who's now almost five, uh, this family uh, made a gift at year end that caught my attention. They were brand new and they, they made a gift of a few thousand dollars. And I reached out to thank them and call them as I was quickly wrapping up for the year, being ready to be on maternity leave. Um, and that was the family had kind of had given their their three boys the opportunity to research or research organizations and make a recommendation to the family as to where to give. And so this was um, a family that I'd never interacted with, who simply researched hope, found our website, was um, was pleased with what they found there and made the choice to, to give a first time gift. Um, and that family now both the parents and um, the one of the sons and his wife are on our executive campaign council and wow. um, have now committed. I can't even do the math. A hundred, <laughs> you know, a hundred thousand times um, what their first gift was uh, in their giving, and so it's really remarkable uh, to see that and to just think about, you know, whether it's thirteen cents from a staff staff person's child or children gathering around a gift catalog and engaging that way or nice. parents being intentional to engage the next generation and in, in stewarding their generosity. There's just, I think this is a time of year where we get to see a lot of those really beautiful stories yeah. um, of engagement and generosity. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that with us. We appreciate it. So we're going to go on to some questions from the audience. I have a couple. Um, feel free, if you're if you're watching us, to, to go to that question in the answer box and type in some questions. Our first question is um, this. The, the, I don't, I'll leave this anonymous, but the person is saying, I'm a startup on the very front end of engaging potential donors. Is a year-end ask an appropriate first ask, or should... Uh, that request be reserved for existing relationships. If it is appropriate, any suggestions on framing the ask and the language that should be used? Uh, let's go to you first, Joe. What do you think? First ask, uh, end of year. What do you think? Yeah, so I, I think it depends on um, what your communication with the donor has been in the past with the prospective donors, the, the list. It's hard to pass up the year end right yeah. giving uh season right because as as jonathan as you said earlier so much of an organization many organizations um revenue comes in at that time and it people are in a giving mood right i mean sure part of it's transactional you get the you get the um you get the tax you know uh deduction but also people are in a giving mood in the year end so it's hard to pass that up um i also always would say you don't want your first communication with that with that with your list to be an ask necessarily yeah. so if they've been cultivated um if they've if you've communicated with them when i say cultivated it doesn't have to be one on one if right. you're start a startup with a list but you've you've warmed to that list you've been talking with them i don't see any reason uh, any problem with making the year end the first ask um and do it you know do it well you know make if you go my rule also always is if you're gonna if you're going to make an ask make it an ask right, right. so there's a temptation um both for you know new organizations um as well as with new prospective donors to even if you cultivate them to make the ask a very soft ask let's just yeah. see what happens um, my advice would be don't do that, you know, let your cultivation be cultivation and do it really well. And then let your ask be an ask. No one should read your ask and not know that they were asked for money. That's really great advice. Uh, Erica, thoughts about that? 
Yeah. I mean, my thought is just make it personal. So um, if you're feeling uneasy about including that group of people in kind of a mass end of your ask, then segment them out and reach out to them very individually, like Joe was just alluding to with kind of a very clear invitation that's relevant to your conversations thus far, as he said. So I think as much as we can at this point in the year, you know, we've got to have our marketing communication that goes out inviting people to give in a mass a mass way, but then as much as we can personalize that invitation and taking the time to do that, um, I think we'll go a long way. Acknowledging like, I know we've just had a chance to get to know each other. Here's a few needs. I want you to feel aware of them, um, giving the gift of awareness, I think in those cases, especially as a startup, as a smaller organization that I imagine probably has very tangible needs for what giving can do for your organization, right? And so helping give your, um, your donors the gift of awareness of what those very tangible needs are. Um, I'll, as a global organization, ours are not as tangible. You know, once you get larger, it's a lot harder to say, we really need, we really actually truly need giving for this very specific thing that becomes much harder. So I think when you're smaller, you almost have the gift of being able to make it a much more specific and tangible ask for your donor. And I think people, especially at this time of year, really yeah, appreciate those opportunities. So that gift of awareness of what those needs are, I think can go a long way in a personalized setting. Wonderful. We'll do one or two more questions from the audience. This is a question that might be for you, Erica, but you were talking earlier about asking intentional questions to your donors, especially if maybe they signal that they're not going to give in the next year or so. And could you maybe just elaborate and give some questions? I think the I think the question to you is, um, what do you ask the donor to learn more about maybe why they're not giving, um, things of that nature? It might be, like you said earlier, maybe they own a business, maybe it's something else. But can you just give some questions that you like to a- ask in those instances, whether it be, I guess, a, a down economy or not? Yeah, I think often I found um, in my years of fundraising that the most helpful way for me to ask that is in light of how I can best support them and their engagement with our organization. So I think about a major donor who didn't make a gift. And in my mind as a fundraiser, I'm thinking they don't want to give to Hope anymore. They're a lapsed donor. I don't know why, but my role is to understand why. And so meeting with them in person and having the courage to bring that up and say, hey, I, I know you didn't make a gift last year. I would love to understand how I can best support your engagement with Hope this year. Um, are there opportunities for that? And, and the response was, I didn't give, like, just didn't know that they didn't make that gift. And so sometimes I think that's such a good reminder to me of like, sometimes it's that simple. (laughs) Sometimes they just didn't realize, and it's not personal and it's not a reflection on their desire to engage. Um, And so some of that is just knowing the personality of your donor. Are they very calculated in their giving approach or that they're, you know, they give at the same time every year. Um, or are they the kind of person that you just really have to track down and stay on top of? And that person probably values the December 31 reminder, whereas that would feel pushy with other people. Um, so sometimes I, yeah, remind myself of that. And then when I am asking that question, like I said, I think often thinking about how can I best support your engagement with hope? Um, and at that point, you know, hopefully I've already asked questions around how are things going for you and your family? How has your business been doing? What are you most excited about with it? What's been challenging? Um, But then saying, you know, what would it look like for me to um, help support your engagement with Hope this year? Would a proposal for giving be helpful? Are you, if you're open to considering giving this year, is there a helpful time for me to follow up? Kind of giving yourself that like direct awareness of what's the helpful way for me to circle back with you to follow up on this question I'm asking instead of just like, well, I hope I'll hear back from you. Um, And if I don't, I'll just write it off. So I think asking the question, but then creating an avenue to follow up with them on it uh, so that you give yourself permission to circle back. That is great advice. And I like what you said about, could I share a proposal with you? I think too often people forget to ask that. They go ahead and they, they spend a lot of time and they exhaust themselves making an elaborate proposal and the donor maybe didn't signal that they want to see it, right? So it's a great question to just, you know, ask, I think when, when the time is right, this will be our last question for the webinar and it's about stewardship. And so the question is, should we rethink stewardship right now during this economic climate, um, especially related to if a nonprofit sends gifts of thanks to donors, is that 
not a good look right now when sort of when times are quote unquote bad. Joe, do you have thoughts about that? If a nonprofit sending people either year end gifts or maybe not year end, um, is, is it not appropriate right now, given what maybe some people uh, are dealing with? Yeah, I, it, I think it depends on if uh, how extravagant those gifts are. Um, I don't I, I, I wouldn't suggest that you need to cut off everything that you're, you know, that you're sending to your donors. Yeah. Um, that, of course, assumes that the messaging you're using with your donors is not coming from kind of that poverty mindset. And it probably shouldn't. Right. But but if you're obviously if you're I always recommend not doing emergency fundraising appeals, you know, um, unless you really have to. Um, but if you're doing emergency fundraising appeals and then sending out gifts, probably not, probably not a good look. The most important thing I think is just as we've been talking about here today to keep up the activity, to yeah. keep up the stewardship activity, to keep talking to donors, to keep them, you know, keep updating them, keep talking with them. Um, that's, if anything, um, you should be doing more of that now, you know, rather than less. Um, if you're not, if if for financial reasons your organization isn't going to be sending out gifts um, that maybe perhaps it it did in the past, my general rule of thumb with fundraising is it's only weird if you make it weird. Like you could mm -hmm. make that a really weird situation by saying we can't afford it, and you know turning it into you know. Or you can, you know, either not acknowledge it or acknowledge it by saying we've decided this year to do something else with that money instead, something positive, something mission focused, and yeah. really focus on that. Great advice. Well, thank you again, Joe and Erica, for joining me today. This has been really insightful. I'm sure all of our guests have a lot of takeaways and things to think about as they finish 2022 and they they venture into 2023. Let me just plug two events or things before um, we, we end today's webinar. So the first thing I'd like to promote is on December 8th, um, the Center for Civil Society, we are having a webinar on effective altruism. It will be hosted by me. I have some amazing guests. I have William Shambra, Joshua Hoekschild, and Tim Reichert will be talking about effective altruism. Is it truly effective? Is it truly altruistic? Of course, effective altruism in the news these days because of Sam Bankman-Fried, who was in a lot of ways seen as one of the leaders of the effective altruism movement. And of course, his um, crypto empire has come crashing down. And so it's had <laughs> some news for effective altruism. Let me also mention our brand new in-person seminar. So American Philanthropic and the Center for Civil Society, we are offering our first ever Major Gifts Seminar. Uh, the Major Gifts Seminar will be in sunny Phoenix, Arizona, uh, January 17th. I can't wait to go because I live in the Midwest. So if you would like to join us for our Major Gifts Seminar, or you have a colleague or uh, a friend who would like to have a, have a tune-up on Major Gifts, or maybe they're new to Major Gifts fundraising, the link is in the, the webinar chat. Again, that's January 17th in Phoenix. We'd love to see you there. Um, but again, thank you again to Joe and to Erica for being with me today. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Good to be with Bye. you.